Hi everybody, welcome back to Ed Psych. I think we have um, a super interesting chapter this week. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. I think it's totally fascinating to think about uh, different approaches to learning, different ways that our our minds and brains work. So um, this week, we I wanted to just let you know we're really close. Um, we're we're ripping down towards the end of the semester, and uh, only four more weeks in this class until finals. Your case study number two uh, is due November 26, so we'll be finishing up the all the all the material that you'll need to ask your students um, those questions uh, before Thanksgiving, and you'll have Thanksgiving to um, finish up, and then you'll turn it in right when we get back. Um, we worked last week on behaviorist approaches to learning. I think some of you had some super interesting things to say about how it fits or does not fit with your own um, philosophy, and uh, many of you noticed things that your mentors were doing that you thought were great. Many of you noticed things that your mentors were doing that didn't really suit you and your style, and um, maybe it'll be the same this week. You'll notice different things, different cognitive approaches um, that's happening at your school. Uh, almost all of you noticed a lot of behaviors amused at your school, and that's pretty much what I would expect. Uh, this week, our objectives are to de define and explore ways in which people learn and process information which I think is fine, totally fascinating, and to relate cognitive learning theory to our own teaching and learning. And you'll be working with your um, small group to use um, cognitive learning theory in your planning. I put a document up on Moodle that you'll be working with after this. So cognitive approaches, um, they began um, from visual perception theory in the 20th century, early, early 20th century. And um, they began with this idea from the Gestalt idea that uh, learning takes place as a burst of insight, or sometimes we call it the aha moment. Um, maybe you have a burst of insight when you see this. Maybe you've seen this already. Um, if you have, it's still fun to play with. If you haven't seen this before, um, do you see an elderly woman or do you see a young woman when you look at this? drawing. And I want you to pay attention to what is happening in your mind as you look at the picture and you attempt to move back and forth between the two if you can do that. I'll give you a little time to look at that and you can pause this recording too if you want more time because um, in just a second here I'm going to use my cursor and show you the outlines. Okay, so here's the young woman. She has dark hair and she's kind of got a side profile. This is the back of her neckline. This is her necklace and her neck here. She's got a black blouse on or something. Um, here's her chin and her nose and her eyelashes here. Um, her hair. Okay, so that's the young woman. And if you look again, you can see, possibly, hope, the old woman. Okay, here's her eye. Here's her white sort of babushka kind of wrap over her head. Uh, here's her mouth. Here's her chin. Okay, her nose here and uh, maybe a darker forehead here and maybe some sort of feather or something. Actually, I don't know which of them is wearing that feather. Um, and her chin is sort of buried into her chest. Okay, so as we look at this, we can think about um, what it was that helped you be able to see those images. Was it, were you adding to your understanding? Were you adding to your schema? Or were you um, having a, an aha moment. Maybe some of you have seen this, maybe not if you already have. Maybe you can see something else in this picture. Again, I'll give you a little bit of time before I point out what I see here, and maybe you see other things that I don't see here. But you can pause the recording if you want more time to look, because now I'm going to use my cursor and show you. Um, so here is a Dalmatian dog. Okay, Here's his back. And his head is going down. Here's his little ear, his nose and his neck, his one leg right here, another leg right here, maybe his chest, and then somewhere back here, a back leg. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. So um, maybe you see a shadow over here of a tree. Um, people have seen different things as we look at this image. And again, maybe you have already seen this, but if not, maybe this is a time where you had maybe a burst of insight. Um, and I'd like you to think about in your own discipline, what burst of insight is possible in your, um, in your content area. Maybe in science, it's the moment when, um, when students understand 
um, some concept that you're working on and they suddenly show them in a lab and they get it. Maybe in, um, I like to use the example of when I was learning to throw a bowl on a potter's wheel. In the moment when um, it came to me or I had an aha moment. Maybe it was when you were in uh, your math classroom and one of your students showed you a new way to uh, understand the times tables um, or any other possible uh, aha moments that you have had or that your students have had. Um, so later uh, theorists use this idea of the burst of insight and Bruner talked about having two types of thinking analytical which is a step-by-step -step thinker or an intuitive learner um, the burst of insight. Um, and he also posited that kids have an active role in their own learning and that they, um, they construct meaning. So they build on the information that they already have. And you had that in your reading. Um, so there's lots of ways that um, students take information in and um, keep it in from our, put, put it from our short-term memory into our long-term memory. Um, make sense of it. And you read about dual coding, which is um, that you have two systems in your memory, right? Two ways. One is for uh, verbal memory and one is for um, storing images. So if you look at this little triangle, many of you have probably seen this before. Um, some people say that you remember about 10% of what you read, about 20% of what you hear, possibly about 30% of what you see. And you can see as you move down this triangle, the more active the learning gets, the more uh, the chance of keeping in your memory uh, what you did, whether you taught it or you gave a talk or you did a um, dramatic presentation or you actually did the real thing. And of course, in the most ideal setting in learning, we actually do the real thing and that's how we learn it the most. But um, sometimes our classrooms are more limited and, and we're only doing uh, the top of the triangle, but we're always hoping to have a more active um, role for our students in their understanding. So when we think about information processing, um, of course a question maybe comes to mind about what is the difference between your brain and your mind? And I think you all know that your brain is an actual physical mass in your head and your mind is a theoretical construct. And I think you all know also that we have some form of long-term storage and some form of short-term storage. Um, that human information processing system is super complicated and has some major elements and you read about those um, and hopefully you were as fascinated as I was um, about these types of uh, making meaningful encoding, right? Making, making connections between our short-term memory and our long-term memory. So this slide is somewhat dense and I'll give you a chance to look at it. And again, you can stop this if you'd like to look deeper at it. Um, generally, just to, to kind of chunk it up for you, that we have the sensory mo memory, um, which is usually unconscious and um, takes stuff in, keeps it for one to four seconds before the memory fades. Um, and we have a working memory, which can take input from the sensory memory and the long-term memory. Um, it can hold it for an indefinite amount of time um, as long as that information is rehearsed. And I think that's a, an important thing to notice um, as a teacher. Uh, the information decays in 10 to 20 seconds when the attention is withdrawn. And it can hold about seven or so chunks of information. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind as a teacher. Um, then you look at your long-term memory and um, it directs the entire processing system. It can accommodate large amounts of information for an indefinite time, um, sometimes for the life of a person, and the processing can be conscious or unconscious, and um, information can be lost also through decay. So again, stop this slide if you'd like to look more at it. I think it's a pretty, pretty uh, thick one, dense one. Um, when we think about our working memory, Sentence comprehension uses working memory, um, and that can be overloaded, as you recall. Um, if I say to you some simple sentence like, uh, your shirt is pretty, I think you probably could remember that I said, your shirt is pretty. 
Um, if I said something longer, like the man who has the black lab and lives down the street often gives to charity, I think you could probably even remember all of that, right? Think about what I said. The man who has the black lab and lives down the street often gives to charity. You probably remembered that. But if I say a longer sentence, like the man who said that a cat that the dog chased killed the rat is a liar, maybe if I said it more chunked up, you'd be able to get it better, right? The man who said that a cat that the dog chased killed the rat is a liar, then it might be easier for you to take in, right? You'd be able to mem remember those parts of that sentence, okay? And just, again, to point out that your working memory is limited. And so when we think about giving directions for our students, you want to remember that if we give really long directions without um, chunking and without allowing them to do the tasks um, in discrete parts, they might not be able to do it. Okay, and again, there's that slide. If you'd like to stop it, check it out. So um, we can consciously teach our students to increase um, their declarative and their procedural knowledge. Remember, declarative is like facts, and procedural is more like how to do something. Um, declarative knowledge, you read the manual on something, like your cell phone, um, about how to take a picture with it, and procedural is you actually do it and send it off to your friend or text it to your friend. Okay. So I'd like you to work in small groups this week. Um, you can uh, use the document that I put up on the Moodle site called um, Instructional Planning Using Cognitive Learning Theory. I think it's a useful exercise to work with our content areas in this one because I think all of you will have really good ideas to put in. You're going to create a Google Doc and invite me to see it. Um, and then fill out that, that worksheet and think. I think it's going to be a useful document that you can use you know, f forever. And um, then you'll upload your final by um, 11.55 on Monday. Okay. Next week we're synchronous. We're going to work on motivation and uh, humanistic approaches to learning. Make sure you do the readings and watch the videos before class next week. We have super cool videos on motivation and um, some work by Carol Dweck, which I think is, is totally interesting and, and really relevant to what you're doing. Um, and make sure you continue on your case study number two. And I hope you have a great week. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you in Illuminate next week. All right. Adios.